Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And man, have I got a treat for you this morning. Um, Yeah, this guy, he is killing it in real estate. Um, And I would say as most real estate, successful real estate uh, entrepreneurs become, people just want to know what they're doing, how they're doing it, because there's a million people in real estate. How are the the select few rising to the top. And so they end up uh, being willing to share that knowledge for a price and for a more than more than price and effort, right? They want to see that you're actually committed. So today we're going to be talking to Brandon Barnes. He's part of our, EI Live Real Estate Investing. Um, And he works nationally, although he's located in Atlanta, he works nationally. um, And he just has built uh, a massive real estate to where it's earning over about a million dollars a year revenue. He's just passionate about not just his own success, but really helping you get your success, right? And a trend you'll find with most successful people, they aren't really satisfied with their own success. They're okay with their own success, but really what lights them up is helping other people get success as well. Because if you're just in it for yourself, you find that you're pretty freaking lonely up at the top, but it doesn't have to be lonely at the top and they want more people with them. So I'm excited, Brandon. Thank you for for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be on the Fuel Your Legacy podcast and share your little nuggets. Um, Go ahead and tell us your story. Where did you begin? What was your childhood like? How did you end up where you are today? And, And what was that process like identifying your value and determining what your legacy was going to be? For sure. Thanks, Sam, for having me. Uh, For starters, look, I um, grew up, uh, born near Chicago, but grew up in Atlanta. So one year old, parents moved uh, to Atlanta to stay with some family here and we stayed. Um, So I am Atlanta raised and and bred here. Um, And from early childhood, you know, I always wanted to, you know, find ways to make money you know, selling candy, cutting lawns, uh, you know, doing different things, having parties, hosting parties. I actually did a, I a hosted a party, a pay for party in, in high school with one of my buddies. Uh, so I always wanted to be an entrepreneur so much so that uh, once I, I started at Georgia State University, I transferred to Purdue University. Um, they had an entrepreneurship certificate program. So 15 credit hours. Uh, so I was all in on being an entrepreneur, but my vision for that was I would climb the corporate ladder. My father worked uh, as a corporate CPA and and for Coca-Cola company. And um, I thought that I would climb the corporate ladder and then find this great opportunity to work with a startup, right? That was the vision for how I would become an entrepreneur, but shit stuff happens, right? Life happens. And so um, out of Purdue, got my first uh, opportunity with the H.J. Hines company in Pittsburgh, I met some great people and I'll come back to that uh, in a a second, but um, I worked for Heinz in a leadership development program and I was going to rotate to three different uh, cities, um, you know, in different roles uh, each six months. And uh, literally right after they uh, sent me and, and, and moved me and my family to Illinois, Iowa, the company got bought out. 3G Capital, uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. So I had to kind of commute back and forth to Pittsburgh, from Pittsburgh to the Quad Cities and on the border of Illinois, Iowa, uh, and I found a local job with the Kraft Oskemeyer Company. Uh, so I took that role as a production supervisor. And then, believe it or not, they got bought out. Uh, so uh, things changed a little bit there. And then I had a, an opportunity. I was like, hey, look, it's time for me to get back home. Um, and I had an opportunity to come work with uh, Talenti, uh, an ice cream gelato company. Um, and that was recently acquired uh, by Unilever. So three for three, I ended up at a corporate gig um, that got bought out. And that last stop here in Atlanta 
literally two weeks after getting married to my beautiful wife that I, we met in kindergarten and met again at Georgia State University, you know, two weeks after we got married in Jamaica, young son, um, they fired me. And it just completely rocked my world. And I reached out to a buddy that I met in Pittsburgh and asked him, man, what was that real estate thing you kept telling me about? What was that real estate thing? What was that all about? He said, hey man, look, I actually moved to Atlanta. You can come by, I'm working with this great mentor program. Uh, you can come by, we can drive for dollars together. Uh, so literally January of 2016, I started working real estate, investing, and I never looked back. So that was, that was the beginning for me. And it was by chance, got fired and um, had an opportunity to jump into real estate. I love it. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm, I'm curious because I've never heard it put this way. Um, and, and personally, I wouldn't consider this. Uh, so that I, I'm just trying to clarify my, I, I love learning. So I'm not here to slam anybody else's belief system, but I love learning and I've never considered this. And I would never put it this way. So I want you to explain a concept to me here. Um, when you said you were going to, go from corporate America into entrepreneurship, um, going from corporate America, getting be, or somehow becoming out of corporate America, part of a startup system or a startup company. Um, what part of becoming part of that startup would, would you consider makes you an entrepreneur at that point? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, for, from my perspective at that point, um, you know, just working with a startup, I thought that, you know, that, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, allows you to, you know, use your you know entrepreneurship skills to build a business from ground up. So I guess in my head, maybe it wasn't the right way to look at things, but, um, I, I thought that, you know, Hey, working with a startup company, um, and building a business from the ground up was going to be an opportunity to, you know, flex my entrepreneurship skills and, um, you know, the, the whole, you know, building the business from, from, from ground zero. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm just getting clarification here just because I'm learning. So, um, you would see yourself if that, if that pathway had worked out and this is what I love about life is like, you think one pathway is going to work out and it doesn't, then it goes another way. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. So you weren't thinking you would join a, a startup that was already existing, come in and help them in whatever way they needed, like fulfill a role as a CEO or fulfill a role as something inside of the startup. You were thinking you were going to get a bunch of guys once you were successful in in corporate America and kind of side hustle it and start a startup and have that go big. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was that goal initially. Um, you know, I, along the way, part of the entrepreneurship certificate program was, um, you know, coming up with different ideas, um, you know, maybe an invention or, you know, a new way to do something that was, you know, pre-existing. So, you know, whatever I could wrap my hands around, that would allow me to, you know, take um, a, you know, a business or an opportunity from kind of the infancy stages, you know, on to a large, you know, potentially multinational uh, company or corporation was the vision uh, that I had. And, you know, again, I, I think I've heard the saying, um, you know, man, you know, people plan and God laughs, right? Like, it's just <laughs> like, whatever you thought was the plan, you know, it doesn't always work out like that. And that's, you know, in essence, what happened. Yeah, I would say that's that's an over generous statement. <laughs> I, I would say closer. It never works out that way. Like, <laughs> right. My plans, I, I can't think of any plan that like was executed. Everything happened the way it was supposed to. It just doesn't happen in my life. But I love that. And that's kind of what I was digging for. When he's talking about entrepreneurship, he's talking about like, how can we take bring, bring fresh eyes to a new, to, to an industry and create something, present an idea, a philosophy, a perspective that nobody's thought of before that nobody's really put some effort in to. And th the reason I think that's important to think about is that's a, that's a concept that's applicable everywhere, right? Maybe your parents, your grandparents, your, your aunts, your uncles, your, um, your brothers and sisters, whatever, maybe they all parent one way. And you're like, you know what? I don't like the way their kids are turning out. I don't know anybody who's going to parent the way I'm going to parent, but I'm going to freaking try, you know, right. because I right. want I want something different. Now you may fail miserably. They may turn out worse than you planned, but 
the thing is you tried, you brought something new to the, to the environment. I think that that's, that's in parenting, but that could be any role, whether you're in corporate America, the people who get paid the most in corporate America are, are generally the people who are willing to take the risk to be innovative. Right. Right. I, I have a, I have a client right now and he works for a, a, a large corporation and his, his higher ups, they keep giving him more and more stuff to do. And he keeps delegating more and more stuff to the people under him. So he's got like a very low level activity job, but gets paid very well for, for how much effort he does. And they're like, why, why aren't you doing this? He's like, why would I do it if this person can do it better? Like that's his right. skill set. Like, why would I, anyway, so he's innovating inside of this corporate structure and, and making his life easier, his family's life better. He's getting pay raises because he's becoming somebody who can get stuff done and people can count on. And he's still inside of the corporate structure. So the same mentality of entrepreneurship, I believe not just can be fostered anywhere, but it, it's in your best interest to foster that type of mentality, even if you're in corporate America still. Sure. That's, that's kind of my belief system. And something happened to where you were able to go from what your first corporate job, what was it? What, seven, the ketchup company, H.A. Ketchup. Heinz. Okay. Yeah, Heinz Ketchup. Um, we, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, great opportunities uh, came from just being at the right place, the right time. Like Purdue opened the door for me to intern with them two different summers. And then also I minored in German because I started German here and uh, as a fourth grader. Um, so I actually had a, uh, a role in Germany with Heinz for one semester. So I did a co-op. Um, so they really gave me a, a great shot and then right into that leadership development program. Um, but then they got bought out. I, I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was Valentine's day um, that they got bought out. And then I went and then going to, Kraft Oskemeyer, they got bought out by the same company. So it followed me there. And now as people know it, it's the Kraft Heinz company. Um, so like I said, it just, you, you can plan um, the world and, and to your point, nothing ever works out exactly like the plan. You yeah. Had. yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, I think that's a fascinating thing. You ended up in food in the food service and then you went for, or like the food companies and, and then you, you went from there to real estate. So that's fascinating. Um, and then, yeah, just their promises never, never are what they seem they're going to be. Uh, sure. I, was, I was working with a company when I was 18 and they had brought me in and they're like, Hey, we want to make you a manager. And I don't think that people intentionally are lying to anybody. It's just a lot of these deals, these sales, they're so backroom. They're like deep, deep backroom. Only a select people know about them. They're sworn to secrecy for, for multiple reasons that are actually beneficial when it comes to like investing and, and insider trading and stuff. It's good that this right. is public information, but uh, for so many reasons, there's only a few people who know about it. So e even very close to the top, they could be hiring people thinking and making promises saying, Hey, look, this is going to be a long-term relationship. You're going to be here. I can see you growing over the next 20 years, retiring here they're selling you the dream and it's not that they are intentionally lying to you. It's just so easy for that dream to change just on the market wins, the trade wins like coronavirus comes and now the whole um, supply supply chain is screwed up, you know, from right. Right. We're, we're getting our bottles from China. We're getting our, our sugar from Mexico and we're getting like all this stuff from everywhere to get everything in Illinois to make the ketchup. Right. And then shipping is all disrupted. I mean, everything gets disrupted. And so then stuff has to change. And that's something that we can't, uh, we can't foresee. I mean, this company, they're like, Hey, be a manager. It's like, no, I don't want to. I chose to go do summer sales. When I got back from summer sales, the company was shut down and gone out of business. And they were going to hire me as a manager. I was like, Whew, glad I didn't take that job. Right. I would have been out of work. Right. So, so it's just funny. You just never, um, yeah, you just never know what that's going to be like. I'm, I'm curious, what was your, um, when, when you were moving companies, what was your motivation for moving? Was it like when they got bought out, did you have an option to stay or were you fired that from that first job or let go? Not necessarily fired. I don't know what the right word is. Yeah, no. Go. So my wife is a teacher and her Georgia license did not have reciprocity in Pennsylvania but it did in Illinois, Iowa. So when they moved me there, she actually started 
teaching. It's like she actually started the school year. They moved me over the summer and she started teaching. And so they gave me a role that was back in Pittsburgh. Uh And so, but they allowed me to commute and do, you know, remote work. Uh, But I still had to drive back and forth, back and forth uh, for periods of the time. And good thing I had a buddy that I worked with um, with in Hines in Pittsburgh um, that allowed me to stay with him. He had a two bedroom apartment uh, townhouse um, that he owned. And and so he allowed me to stay with him and I commuted back and forth. But she had already started teaching. So I had to then find something local and I started to apply. uh, And the one of the oldest Oscar Meyer plants is in that town in the quad cities um you know like a 40 minute drive from the 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 heinz plant in in the quad cities um and so i was able to get that position to keep my family together and we had a young son so that's why i you know found something locally and then i switched over um to the craft just to be then bought out by the same company, <laughs> which was crazy. And then, like I said, we, we were there for a few years and I was like, look, it's time to get back to home base. And so I started looking for, for positions um, and I got the position back um, in Atlanta. But I knew that they had been acquired, um, Talenti, uh, the gelato company by uh, Unilever. Uh, so I knew that going in, but they found a reason to fire me. Um, Long story short, but it was actually wrongful termination that I actually won. And so six months, so I, in January 2016, I started real estate by June. Um, you know, I won an undisclosed you know, settlement that actually allowed me to go on and start my LLC um, and, and hire my first teammate who's still with me to this day. My assistant, I hired her full time um, June 2016. Uh, but from the moment that I started in real estate, um, you know, I started doing everything, driving for dollars, sent my first thousand postcards. I got my first contract in February, did my first deal in March uh, for 15K, which I split with the buddy that got me into the business. Um, and so I had immediate success. I stopped applying for jobs. I was like, look, this is what I want to do. This is my way to be an entrepreneur. This is a way to fulfill my dream, my passion uh, to be an entrepreneur. So. Um, you know, it was, it was still, it was so rough, but I, with that great mentor program, I did six figures that very first year. That's awesome. I'm curious, did, was it like a mindset shift? Cause again, I don't know how much you were making at these other companies, but was it a mindset shift to like, and be able to make 15 grand with one transaction and just be like, man, money is easier to get than I thought it was before. Like this, if this is how stupid simple it is to make money, this is like, I can't not do this. Right. I mean, the, the, the dream that I was following though, was, you know, understanding, and my buddy was a great motivator, understanding that, you know, the majority of, you know, wealthy people build their wealth through real estate. So it just made a lot of sense. Um, and for me to be able to come in without a license, uh, with, you know, little, little money up front, not having to buy, the actual asset and then wholesale it. So either assign it or double close um, using transactional funding. It just made so much sense to me. And, and I, I knew that I could, you know, use what I learned in the corporate experience to build a business the right way. Hire my first assistant who really gave me stability uh, as a company, you know, KPIs, marketing, um, you know, tracking uh, our activity. Um, I, I, I leverage the skill set from the corporate role, um, problem solving, um, you know, having lived in multiple states, being able to connect with different people and, you know, talk about the Midwest, talk about farming, talk about all these different things. It just allowed me naturally to be able to connect with people and then build out a business that, you know, actually we took a systematic approach to everything that we did, you know, uh, operations manual, et cetera. Um, that allowed me to like really build a business. And that was the biggest thing. And I had a great mentor as well. And Tom Kroll from wholesaling Inc. Um, so I, I was just super excited. The money was, was, was cool, but I wasn't, you know, satisfied with, you know, making 15 K it was just, Hey, this is just another transaction. I'm trying to build like 
you know, a million dollar business here out the gate. I already had my mindset on what I wanted to do. Ultimately. I think that's so cool. And I think that's a, a that's a blessing that a lot of people don't uh, recognize. I, I came from a background of not really ever working in corporate America. Um, I, I mean, I guess that job that I told you about is sort of corporate, it was a, it, but it was just like a car wash. Like it was a blue beacon truck wash. So that location was shut down. They're still all over the country, but that, that location was shut down. And, um, and then I worked for pizza hut for like two months. That was hell. Ugh. <laughs> not, not pizza. Hut's fault. An actual store or corporate. No, no, it was in the store as a waiter. So oh. like by, by no means am I signing pizza, hut. love, love them, <laughs> love their pizza, love what they do. I just did not food service industry is not for Sam. Like no <laughs> way is it for Sam. So, um, that, that's what I learned from that. But the thing is when you come from a corporate background, you have kind of an idea of how systems work. You have an idea of like, this is, this is who's responsible for what, this is how we separate roles. This is what a, a SOP, a standing operator exactly. procedure looks like. A lot of entrepreneurs, they're just like, I can't handle corporate America. I can't, this is me. Okay. So I'm talking about Sam Knickerbocker here. Um, I, I can't handle being in a situation where somebody else tells me what to do. Like it's not, not going to happen. And so I ne I don't even have that experience. So then when I've been trying to build my business, it takes a lot more time investment and um, paying of coaches to just help me like, Hey, how do I turn my entrepreneur thing that I'm doing into an actual business that's predictable, has stability that anybody off the street can come in and work. Right. right? And, and something that's duplicatable because that's something that is um, kind of dis dismissed with a lot of entrepreneurs. I think, Oh, I'm going to be a self-employed entrepreneur. I don't have to answer to anybody and you can do that, but you're going to forever own your job rather than own a business. And right. hundred percent. Um, miserable. Yeah, uh, for, for sure. And, and I think that, um, that, that skill set, you know, to your point, you know, making sure that I built things out, um, that was duplicatable, that was trackable and consistent, uh, was very important for me. Um, and you know, my mentor telling me like, Hey, hire, an assistant first. A lot of people want to just, you know, be willing and dealing or, 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 you know, um, treat it as if like, it's like, I'm, I'm hustling real estate. Like the, the, the only way that you can actually build a business is through hiring specific team members to do specific tasks. And I, I suggest to all folks that are like getting into wholesaling or doing, you know, anything like that, it's, it's hire a strong administrative assistant to keep your, you know, business, you know, systematic and trackable and, um, and, and keep everything in line. Um, so that, that was super important. I didn't want to hustle real estate. I wanted to build a business and that was the best thing for me. Yeah, no, I think, I just think that's a massive distinction. I'm glad you, I mean, you, you put it better than I could because you've done it and I haven't. So, um, <laughs> I'm working on it, but it's difficult for me. Um, uh, cause I, I've hired people in the past, but then I don't even know what to tell them to do because like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm putting out fires so fast that I don't like trying to tell somebody else, Hey, this is what I'm doing. These are the things that are going on in my head. Cause when you've been doing it for five to seven years, you don't even think about all this resource exactly. knowledge that you just have in your head Exactly. that you need to put on paper so that any monkey can come in and, and take care of that. You know, like you can hire a robot to do something. And, and, and like I said, that's why my, my administrative assistant, my VA was so key because she was able to understand everything that I was doing and then create an operations manual so that anytime I hire on someone else, they always have her to support them and she knows what should be happening. Um, and she can, you know, plug and play different, help me plug and play different team members and, and have a list of, Hey, this is how we've done things historically. This is what, you know, you'll need to be able to do. And this is what success looks like. Uh, so that was super, super key um, for me. Um, to, to bring in that administrative assistant. Yeah, I, I love it. So um, I'm curious, just because I want to get some terminology out of the way, because I know that some people understand this. If you're in the real estate game, you probably know what it means to drive for dollars, um, what a wholesale is, what, what some of this terminology is. But if you're sitting there on the outskirts, you're thinking, well, that sounds pretty nice. I would like to get in. What are some key phrases that your, your industry is using um, that somebody could gain some understanding here so they could have an intelligent conversation of, maybe determining what they'd actually be in, interested in real estate. 
For sure. Um, well, the one thing I will say is that, you know, people shouldn't be so wrapped up in a lot of the fancy terminology because at the end of the day, you want things to be as simple as possible for yourself and for your team. Um, but the most, you know, uh, used kind of buzzword is ARV, right? So after repair value, what is the value of a property after it's fixed up, after it's renovated? That's what that stands for. Um, the other most important thing that I think is is important, and, and, and uh, I know we'll get to this, but my business is built upon sending offers, uh, sending more offers. And so the, the key term with that is Mayo. So your maximum allowable offer, uh, that's super important. Um, and then the last one I'll, I'll leave your, your listeners with <clears throat> is equity. Um, and, you know, equity being um, the, the difference between if there is a mortgage, um, the difference between what the home is ultimately worth, like what it would appraise at um, versus what you owe on the property. So simple terms, if the home, would appraise at a hundred thousand um, dollars, and the homeowner has a mortgage for eighty thousand dollars. They owe eighty thousand dollars on this home, then they have twenty percent equity in the home. Um, and if you own the home free and clear, you have a hundred percent equity. Um, so that's that's super important um, to make sure that when you're making offers using your your Mayo, your maximum allowable offer, um, that there is still equity in the home so that when my offer um, is enough to satisfy, you know, anything owed against the property, there's still some equity left over uh, so that the homeowner can make some money or the new buyer, once they purchase it, they have some equity uh, in their home. Um, and, you know, to, to, to bring it full circle, um, if the home is worth, you know, uh, appraised and it's fully fixed up the arv in that same scenario would be 100k if that was what it, if, if that home was completely renovated top of the line the arv would be 100 the equity would be, would, would be 20 percent and so my maximum allowable offer um you know I'd, I'd make it a little bit above um you know what's owed against the property so that there's a little bit of equity left so, so you'd maybe offer 85 or 90,000 based on what your rules are is how much you need to make on a property. For sure. That sounds yeah, like so a rental to me. Say again. <laughs> I said, that sounds like it would be a good rental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you wouldn't be able to, you know, you know do yeah, right, a you know, fix and flip or anything because there's not enough spread, but yes. Yeah. Um, but, but I think this, this is the other thing that again, all this, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this. He is. So you're just going to need to reach out to him, but, um, and you could reach out to a hundred different uh, real estate investors. And the reality is every one of them has different rules. It's just like going to a, a financial advisor or an investor and equity, anything. They all have their different rules. Even tax advisors, they have different thresholds where it's like, I want to be this safe with my clients. So if you want more risk in your taxes, that, that advisor, that tax advisor is not going to be good for you because he keeps it the line here. Um, and then you can go find, Hey, what risk tolerance do you like with your taxes or right. with your health? I mean, there's some health, people who are like, Hey, we want this much risk in our health. I want to go to only natural path because I want this type of risk. I want to go to all medicine because I want this type of risk. For sure. Everything in our life, we have to manage risk. And the one thing is, uh, so maybe you have a story about this. I'm curious because you have your investing rules of like when something makes sense, when it doesn't make sense. Right. Have you ever broken those rules? And what was the result of when you like decided, ah, this one I'm gonna do, it. even though it doesn't fit within my investment profile or my, my rule, it, I think it'll still be okay. And you break the rule, what, then what happens? Yeah, um, I would say probably the worst rehab that I ever did uh, was one where, you know, it, it probably, um, we purchased a home um, and it, when you, when you decide to say, hey, I'm going to do some work on the home um, and you're a wholesaler, it should already be a great wholesale deal. Um, if, if, if you think like, Hey, I'm going to be able to make more because, you know, I'm going to do some work and I'm going to sell it. And I'm going to make so much more. Um, you know, everything in real estate is about if you buy right. So you buy it at the right price. Um, and so that property was not a great wholesale deal you know, maybe it was like a 10 K deal, but I said, Hey, if I fix it up, I'm going to make so much more. 
Well, what ended up happening is, you know, we did the work, we sat it on the market, you know, I purchased a home for maybe 80 or so, um, and maybe 85, 90. Um, and you know, we did some work to ultimately sell it, uh, like at 120. Um, but once we finished, it sat on the market, it was on the market for a while. Um, we actually had to, you know, based on all the feedback that we got, we actually needed to, you know, redo the roof and, you know, put some more money into it. Um, and then ultimately when we sold it, when it was all said and done, we may have made, you know, 15 grand on it, but I could have wholesaled it in the beginning for 10 K and just been done with it versus like the five months or so it took to actually sell probably like six months it took to complete that project time energy wasted money like me, the quick 10 and so that rule for me now is like look if i if i can't wholesale it and make you know 20 30 grand i should have no you know thoughts about actually you know renovating it or or wholesaling it if you will um because it it if you're going to, if you think that you're going to be, have a great property, you know, after you renovate it and do actual, do work to it, it needs to be a great wholesale deal. If it's not a great wholesale deal, don't even think about, you know, doing a full renovation. That's my, that's my take on it. And I broke that rule. And because of that, I wasted time, you know, still made a little money on it, but you know, for six months worth of work and tying up cash for that long, you know, I could have just wholesaled it out the gate for 10 K. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> again, cause this is about legacy. This show is about legacy and applying these principles. I bring on business people cause it, I feel like business makes the most sense to me. And I feel like if I run my life like a business, I'm going to be happier in the long run. Um, so that's why I bring people on, uh, business owners on this podcast, but how does this, this concept of this rule of if it's not a great deal to begin with, don't touch it. How does that apply to relationships? Yeah. Um, your spouse, your kids, your, your five people around you, your mentors, your business coaches, how does it apply there? Yeah. So great. I guess kind of story for that is, you know, I met my wife, we actually went to, you know, grade school together and then we met again at Georgia state university. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to, you know, um, I was pretty mediocre grades, um, in high school, um, but I knew I wanted to go to a big name school, you know, big 10 school or, or something with some notoriety. Um, and so my goal, my plan was to, which was actually a pretty good plan because it actually worked and we executed <laughs> on it was to go to college, go to, you know, um, state university, Georgia state university, get really good grades and make myself more attractive to be able to go to a bigger school. Cause right out of high school, I wasn't going to be able to get into Purdue or anything or Vanderbilt, which was my top two. Um, and so, um, you know, meeting Vanessa, uh, sophomore year, you know, I had to make a decision you know, once I told her like, Hey, I just got into Purdue. They accepted me, you know, you know, should we do this as a long-term long distance relationship? I'm going to have to go live in, you know, uh, Northwest Indiana. Uh, I had to make a decision, you know, um, could I see myself waking up to this woman for the rest of my life? And so like, if it was a good enough relationship now, you know, it, it, it would then you just translate to a great relationship uh, over a lifetime. And that decision for me was, yes, I, I knew that I could, you know, I, I wanted to wake up to this woman for the rest of my life. And because it was a great relationship that we had here uh, locally, then it was going to be a great relationship long term. And she checked the box early on. We checked the box in our uh, early dating uh, a few years later, we were married and we just celebrated our five year anniversary. So hey, that's I didn't awesome. break that rule. <laughs> hey, congratulations. But the, and I think that's so important is like, I've seen so many people who they just get married because quote unquote, it makes sense or they get married because they have a child with somebody. And so now they feel obligated or whatever. And I'm not here to say you shouldn't be with your spouse or whatever. That's not my, per my intention, but like, in every area, like, do you just go get a job just because it's okay? Or do you get a job because like, at least it's a great job. It's a great fit right now. Now he got had a few great jobs 
and then they turned out to be sour, right? Like right. you can't foresee the future and I'm not professing that I can either, but if it doesn't make sense, at least in the beginning, phew, write it off, right? I, I made exactly. that mistake getting clients when I first started in my business. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm a new business owner, helping people, I wanna help anybody. So I would just accept anybody as a client and I, you get the bottom of the barrel, right? When you're just allowing anybody <laughs> to come in, you get the bottom of the barrel, they're all whining, they're all c- complaining about what's going on. And it's just like, man, this is not going to work long term. And so what I changed to was, look, if if it's not a great relationship, if you're not so happy about my service, I just have this little rule personally, right? Because this filters out who's a good client for me. If you're not so happy about what I can do for you that you want to go introduce me to 10 people, that then when, if, when something bad happens between our relationship, like, cause I manage people's money. So like if, if the market goes down, you know, some, something out of my control happens and I have to come to give you some, some maybe not so great news. If it didn't start out great, just think of unhappy you're going to be when I have to give you, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, for me, it's like, nah, if you're not happy enough that you want to go tell the whole world about me, then you're just not happy enough to be a client at the get go. Right. Right. So I, I, have, I have that rule and I don't break that rule anymore. I broke it a few times after I said it. And now it's just like, no, nope, this is, this is the rule. If you don't like it, the door's right there. I never lock my doors when I have guests <laughs> at any time. You gotta have uh, standards, man. You gotta have standards yeah, for sure. For sure. So I'm, I'm curious, what would you say your secret like habit, mindset, or behavior is that's helped you create this legacy um, so far that you're building? And, and how could we adopt that into our lives and, and maybe grow and develop ourselves? Yeah, look, I, at the end of the day, it's treating people the right way. Um, it's, you know, one of the rules um, you know, um, life rules, uh, life values, you know, treat others the way that you would want to be treated. Um, and so with everything that we do, every transaction that comes across our desk, uh, we try to do everything in our power to give the best service, um, to that homeowner. And even if we're not the solution for them, try to help, you know, connect them with someone else that can be of uh, a better service for them. Uh, And by doing so, um, you know, wholesalers can easily get a bad name um, in, you know, any city. Uh, But by doing so, you know, thank goodness I've, you know, never had any um, really negative reviews. There was like one person that reported us because we were BBB rated um, and we resolved it. Um, and it really, the issue was uh, of our own, but by, by treating every transaction, you know, the right way, how you would want to be treated in that same transaction, uh, if the shoe was on the other foot, um, you know, uh, you'll, you'll continue to put out, you know, uh, good karma, uh, you know, have a good reputable name, um, in this industry. And, you know, when stuff is the fan or, you know, people, um, you know, want to come down on wholesalers, uh, we're never on that you know, uh, that list of people that, you know, they're saying like, yo, don't do business with them. So uh, just always just trying to treat people how I want to be treated. That's a life rule. That's a business rule. Um, and, and just doing right things. We've had great testimonials, um, no negative reviews on online, um, and, and continue to, to, to repeat that rinse and repeat that with everybody that we deal with. I love that. And I think that that's like one of the biggest things I might sneeze here. For sure. I bless you. There we go. Thank you. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I can think of is it's like just treating people the way that you want to be treated. Not everybody's going to like the way you treat them that when you do that, when you obey that rule. Um, and in fact, a lot of relationship experts will say, treat people the way that they want to be treated rather than the way you want to be treated. And there's some truth to that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take into consideration how somebody else wants to be treated and have some compassion and consideration for other people's <laughs> desires. But ultimately, if you're a chameleon and you aren't sticking by who you are and your integrity, then it's going to just create more problems in the future. Because then that person that you treated the way that they wanted to be treated, when they find out that you treat somebody else different, they're like, oh, no, my my image of this person's all screwed up. And it's like, well, I'm, it's the same person. So would you rather have your constant or your image changing and as a business from a branding perspective you got to have a constant image you can't have a changing image so the people who like you they'll work with you the people who don't like you generally they will never show up to work with you and so that's right. really bad reviews because the people who don't want to work with you they don't work with you same with same with me right. who don't want to work right. with sam they never get past the first phone call because i tell them what's expected and they're like oh, i don't like that hey that's cool 
It's just not a good fit right. that, you know? 100%. So I'm curious, how, how do we get a hold of you if we wanted to learn more about what you're doing, maybe join you or have start something on the side? Like, what does that process look like? How do we get a hold of you? Is there coaching, a mentorship? Obviously, you had a mentor. And what does that look like? Yeah. And I'll say this uh, for anybody in anything, any situation, having a mentor help guide you to where you want to go is going to be the most critical thing uh, for your success early on, especially as an entrepreneur. Find somebody that is where you want to be um, and and follow them and 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 do as they say, as they lead out, you know, uh, follow that lead. Uh, and so I do provide mentorship for aspiring real estate investors or wholesalers. Um, but my website is sendmoreoffers.com. And there's some personal links down there at the bottom. Even if you're interested in our monthly meetup where we bring world-class speakers and other real estate investors that come share their nuggets of wisdom each and every month, uh, there's a link to the Facebook group um, at the bottom of the homepage at sendmoreoffers.com. So anytime, um, you, you know, you can click on one of those links, send me a DM. I'd love to chat and uh, share with you what my journey has been in this real estate investing business and help you get to your goals as well. I, I love that, guys. This is this is I love that he named his website Send More Offers. Dot com because the reality is most things in life, not everything, but most things in life is a numbers game. And the person who's doing more is going to win more, bigger, right? It's not, not who has the most money, who sends the most offers, who makes the most proposals, who makes the most dials, who makes the most contacts, who shakes the most hands, right? It's who does the most, who serves the most people, right? Mother Teresa wouldn't be Mother Teresa if she didn't focus her life on serving the most people, right? And so think about that and think, what is my thing that I need to be doing more of, right? Maybe your mom, you need to give more kisses and hugs to your kids. Maybe your dad, you need to spend a little bit more time with your family rather than TV. But whatever it is, what do you need to do more of to be the best at whatever it is you want to be the best at? And yeah, I identify what that is for you and do more of it. Interesting story. I have a buddy that um, also he does my, he's actually one of my coaching students, went to Purdue with me, but he also worked in uh, digital marketing. Uh, so he worked for uh, Microsoft and, and ran their Bing, um, like digital marketing, um, you know, a group of their business. And he took the same principles of sending more offers to homeowners to buy their home. He took that and applied it in his digital marketing agencies to where when he was meeting with clients, um, instead of like, you know, showing them and demoing the product and showing them everything, he actually came to those meetings with the written proposal for his service. And he said, once he started to do that and share those proposals up front, regardless of whether or not they felt like they were a good fit, he started to gain more clients. Um, so this is something that, you know, is transferable to other businesses. Um, but it's, it's, it's finding an opportunity to make sure that you treat that proposal, that offer, um, you know, as a, another marketing piece for you. Don't just assume that you only need to make offers when it feels like you're a fit for each other give them a proposal and an offer regardless of the situation. And you'll find that, you know, you only, you won't not only just do business with the people that are a natural fit, you'll find that somebody will sit on that and reach back out to you. Or maybe you, they didn't think, you know, uh, they were a fit or they were guarded when you first talked and then they consider it and they actually want to do business with you because you took that extra step of giving a proposal or an offer uh, to that person. So super, super transferable. Yeah. Love that. Couldn't say it better myself. So we're entering the, uh, just, just to re-say this, okay. It's send more offers com. Go visit that. If nothing else, just go check out his stuff, his free content and see if it's a good fit. Right. And then maybe he'll send you an offer and then just freaking consider it. Right. There's Let's nothing go. wrong with that. Consider the <laughs> offer. Love it. So, so here's the deal. So legacy on rapid fire. This is one of my favorite sections of the show. Five questions, one word, one sentence answers. Um, this is fast, like game show. Okay. So uh, legacy on rapid fire starts now. Uh, what is holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy today? Um, more marketing, more marketing dollars. Um, 
I'm going to get the right teammate in place to start to do creative financing offers uh, instead of uh, just the cash deals that I've been historically doing. I want to get, I want to add that in uh, to start to create uh, creative financing opportunities with homeowners. And what do you believe is the hardest thing you've ever accomplished? Um, uh, six figures that first year, um, that very first year, uh, on my own, um, you know, having a profitable business, my first year as an entrepreneur, that was super tough. Okay. And what is the greatest success at this point in your life? Um, my four kids, um, I'm, I'm super, uh, proud of the, the great, um, young boys and my one, one young princess daughter who's the youngest. Um, I'm, I'm super uh, grateful that they're, you know, great kids and they're smart and uh, loving and always happy and ener energetic. Fantastic. What's a, what's another secret that you believe contributes to your success? Um, building a business for where you want it to be, not where it is now. So making the right hires for where you want your business to go, not just making the, the proper, the hires for uh, right now or making decisions for the now, make decisions for the future and where you want your business to grow. Love that. And what book would you recommend to the Fuel Your Legacy audience? Um, I would do the one thing. I think that's transferable. The one thing by Gary Keller. Yep. Fantastic book. Awesome. Thank you so much. And this is now my actual favorite part of the show. Okay. So we're going to find out how in alignment you are with what you said, you know, what, where are you headed? So um, we're going to pretend that you've died. We're now six generations from now. So this is your great, 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 great grandchildren. They're sitting around at the dinner table discussing your life. They're trying to say, hey, what did Brandon do? What, how did his life impact the world? How did it impact us? What do you want them to be saying about your legacy six generations from now? Um, I would want them to say that um, Brandon was you know, a trailblazer. Um, he you know, built his success and fortune um, through hard work, determination, um, and, and did things the right way. And then he also helped a bunch of other people uh, fulfill their goals and accomplishments uh, through his mentoring and coaching efforts. Um, you know, as he, as he became successful, he brought other people with him and had some great kids. <laughs> had some great kids, right? Because we're, we're <laughs> part of those. Hey, well, thank you so much, Brandon. Again, go check out his website at, um, Oh man, how do I send, just send more, more offers? offers. Yeah, SendMoreOffers.com. Um, and then also, uh, I have recently published two books on Amazon. So if you want to go check those out, they're journals. One is the Fulfillment Journal. Um, and then the other is called Identifying Your Identity, Redefine Your Defining Moments. I think both of those could have a lot of applicability to what we talked about today as far as staying grounded and building the future that you want consciously first and then see that happen and start unfolding um, in reality as you get some coaching and mentorship from whatever industry that you you want to join but i think uh, send more offers is a great place to start if you're at all interested in real estate so thank you so much brandon and we'll catch you guys next time on fuel your legacy awesome thanks sam Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy.